This is an oral history interview with Mary Allen Wilkes. It's July 6th, 2022. We're in Cambridge, Massachusetts at uh, a studio at MIT, and I'm David Brock. Um, and so to kind of pick off, pick up where we left off, um, I wanted to ask you again about the, the editor on the link, since it's, it seems so central to uh, the operating system and sort of the operation of the computer. And I wondered if you could, um, you know, help me understand the connection between um, this online screen-based editor um, and these two really salient features of the link. It's kind of usefulness for biomedical research and also, it's, um, it, it is a computer intended to be programmed by non-computer professionals. So how, does the, how do you see the editor as relating to both of those aspects of the link? Okay. <laughs> well, the editor, um, like many functions that people use the link for, depended and was, was completely defined by the keyboard and the display. That, that was just like you do today. Um, you had a keyboard, what you typed on the keyboard you saw on the display. Um, and the early editors that I had with, with the link, which were 1962, Lap 2 and Lap 3, 1963, uh, they, you, they, right from the beginning, the editors always used the keyboard and the display. You, what you typed in was called a manuscript, and you could save it on a tape. There were these two little magnetic tapes that I think I described last time. You could save it on the tape and tell it where you wanted to save it. And um, that, that basic functionality carried through right through to lap six, which was three or four years later. Um, the lap six version was, of course, much smoother. It actually used the tapes as a real scroll. We didn't have to use deferred editing techniques and so forth, uh, which people found cumbersome. We were cumbersome. That, um, the memory that we had had before I was able to do lap six was only a thousand 12-bit words of memory. And that what we were able to do before 1965 was very, very limited because then they doubled the memory. And so that made a huge difference. So that's the, that's the basic thing. It was designed to be used online, interactively, highly interactive, uh, not only for editing, but for every kind of application in the biomedical laboratory. I mean, every kind for which the link was suited. And so the, the researchers in the field um, learned very quickly how to use, first they had they learned how to use the operating system because that's what enabled them to write programs. They wrote their own applications. We taught them how to program. Sometimes they would have a, gra a graduate student working with them. I mean, the principal research researcher wouldn't necessarily do the programming himself. They were all men, him. but um, And sometimes he did, but in any event, there would be someone in the lab who would who would sometimes do the programming. Um, and with the operating system, again, right from the very beginning, you could convert the manuscript to a binary program. You could run it on the link. And then there were lots of features right on the console that helped you debug your program. Um, you could step through a program instruction by instruction with some switches on the, key, on the console. There was a, a console. A console, I guess, now is, has morphed into sort of a dashboard for people. Um, but our console had lights that flashed wonderfully whenever things were running, and switch, sets of switches, which were for different, corresponded to different elements of the machine functions. And so all the, all the uh, researchers learned, you know, how to use all that stuff. And you, as I say, you could step through your programs instruction by instruction if you were debugging it till you came to the one that was misbehaving. 
Um, you could halt the machine anywhere your program was running. You could so you could see whether it ran up to a certain position, certain point. Um, you could um, read the contents of the, the the processing units, the what we called the accumulator in those days, and some of the other registers, and so forth. You could vary parameters by turning a, a, a knob on the on the console. So there were lots of, and those knobs were also very critical to people's research because it would help them set parameters for, I don't know, sampling rates or how much data they wanted to see on the display and that sort of thing. I'm not sure that answers your question. <laughs> it, it does, um, but, to, but to just kind of follow up on it uh, slightly, do you, you know, this was... Um, so early to have an editor yeah. in which, you know, you were kind of live editing right on the, the display, the yeah. scope, and it was, you know, very much a kind of what you see is what you get sort of operation. Um, and that mode of editing has become so normalized and naturalized, if you will, for um, so many people who use computers today who aren't necessarily computer professionals, I just wondered if um, when you were developing the software and Link was developing, if, you, if the, you and the group were talking about that facility as something, this, kind, this way of editing, that that would be helpful for these um, Biomedical researchers. Oh know, yes. To, yeah. Oh oh sure yeah yeah, uh, and when I, um, I, I don't think. I mean I it, the link didn't have, the old what to us was old fashioned it wasn't to the rest of the industry but it didn't have the old fashioned, punch card or punch paper tape inputs, um, that the ability to to write your programs online um, and convert them and run them right there as soon as they were converted, um, right in your laboratory and have them hooked up to some experiment um, was what worked for the biomedical researchers because it was all of a piece. And so they didn't know, they didn't know any different. <laughs> <laughs> They didn't know there were harder ways to do this. <laughs> some of them did, because some of them had come from the big sealed off punch card environments and had found it, of course, very difficult to do biomedical research in an environment like that. Well, I wanted to, um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the, the kind of the mode of operation of the computer or, or the when you were using, let's say, lap six, and um, would it, uh, the way in which you could switch between kind of editing a manuscript and also um, giving these kind of uh, meta commands, I think you called yeah. them, to do things like uh, work with the file system or, yeah. or uh, operations of that sort. Yeah. Um, could you could you just describe a little bit how you moved from kind of operating, yeah, as I said, between like working on a manuscript or or entering these uh, meta commands? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lab six normal uh, mode when you when you mounted a tape and push start um, was the manuscript editing mode. So if there was a manuscript on which you've been working recently. That when you turned on the machine, or when you when you push start after you mount, if you put the tape on, um, what you would see was what we called the current manuscript, It'd be the last one that you would have worked on. Um, and while you were looking at that, and you would see a certain number of lines. This is all with reference to lap six now. You, you could well, a lot of it is applied to the earlier ones, but I'll just talk about lap six. Um, you would see. A, you know, a certain number, you can, you can see up to, I don't know, 10 or 12 lines without flicker or, you know, this is an, <laughs> 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 a 
real basic hardware. Um, but in any event, you could see sufficient piece of your manuscript, your what we I call the manuscript, your document, um, so that you could tell where you were. And while you were looking at that, you just there was one key that was assigned to any. It was uh, in the lower right corner, and it said Meta on it. And you hit the Meta key, and it gave you a little arrow at the bottom of the display. You were still looking at your manuscript. It gave you a little arrow at the bottom of the display. Um, and then you typed the first two letters of your command. Uh, Lap 6 had, I think, 16 or 17 commands. Um, they would be save manuscript or add another manuscript to this working area or save part of a manuscript as a new manuscript. You could do that. You could break up manuscripts that way. Um, you could add one manuscript in the middle of another, uh, if for some reason you wanted to do that. You could copy manuscripts. We had two tape units. You could copy manuscripts or binary programs from one tape to another. These are all meta commands. CP for copy, CV for convert. Um, there was, um, Lap 6 had it made, it created an index. The first time you saved a manuscript on any tape, any link tape, it created an index for that tape. And it would, it, it would figure out what blocks were free in which to save the manuscript or the binary. Uh, so you didn't have to keep track, with Laps 2 and 3, you had to keep track of where all your documents were on the tape, so God forbid you should lose that little piece of paper. But with lap six, we had an index, so that was very sophisticated. Anyway, you could display the index. If you wanted to delete um, um, documents or binary programs from your tape, you just you just hit the delete, you just selected one, of, just like you might do today, you just selected one of those entries in the in the index and hit delete gone um, there were commands for um, there was one 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 that was very important called the free meta command which um, told the researcher or the person who was you it was the one you used to write your own apps that integrated with the operating system and all that did was, um, I guess it saved the current. There were certain, certain operations, and that was probably one where the current manuscript would automatically be saved in case there, was some, there were some changes in the memory that hadn't yet been scrolled back out onto the tape. That would be cleaned up before you went and did certain of the other commands. Um, that was probably true with the free meta command, but the free meta command, went from my standpoint, I mean, right, the operating system was very simple. I just told, <laughs> just in the programming manual, it said, in the, in the LAP6 handbook, it just said what you had to do to get back into LAP. It said where, if you, if you do, just type the little arrow F and hit the end, the end of line key, which is like, um, a return, a carriage, like a carriage, we used to call it a carriage return. Right. <laughs> Remember carriages? I no, do. you may not. <laughs> anyway, the return key. Now it's called the return key. Anyway, it's much too long winded. But that all that did was just um, jump to a certain one of the lower numbered registers in the memory. And you were told in the in the handbook what register that was. And so you and, and and what you did was then put in that in those registers whatever you wanted, mm. read the tape, read from the, maybe the other unit, or you know read a program from wherever you had stored it, um, and so tra it just basically transferred control. It's just a jump instruction, and then it would, if you could get back to lap six from your app if you wanted to again under program control, you just in your in your application. You just you just added some you know two or three lines of code to uh, I forget exactly what they were but you know those those two or three lines of code would exit your program and re-enter lap six pulling it off the tape if necessary lap six itself occupied I don't know thirty or forty 
blocks on the tape, which was the memory itself was the equivalent of eight blocks, although only four of them were programmable. So mm. the there was a, lap six was constantly pulling different pieces of itself on and uh, off the tape. Right. Um, it, it just wrote over itself, literally just wrote right over itself in uh, lots of instances. Interesting. So um, it was the tape was very you know was critical to the whole was really critical <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and I wanted to ask a, a little bit um, of a follow-up from, from our last interview, which was we had talked about how uh, you rarely uh, used a printer with lap six, or you rarely, you know, printed things out to, to paper in whatever fashion. Um, but I just wanted to ask a little bit more about what facility the the oper lap six or the um, and the link had for paper output, if you will. Yeah. Um, and it seemed like there was there were there were two 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 modes of paper output. One was print manuscript, and the other one was list. Yeah. And it seemed like. Print manuscript was one that produced like left justified text and um, maybe put in line breaks, you know, so as not to break in the middle of a word. And list was more like for listing the um, instructions of a program. Yeah. Um, is that does that get? That's at correct. It? Yes, okay. there were there were in fact I think three print instructions. Uh -huh. um, I never. I never used a printer. I, I I was perfectly happy just, you know, you you don't have a printer necessarily attached to your laptop, or even your desktop. You can do an awful lot of work, and then oh, I need to print something. All right, then you got to find a printer. You know, of course, I have a printer at home now. I do print things, but I I know the whole year in, when I was in Baltimore writing Lab Six, I did not have a printer. And I didn't send laps. I didn't send my manuscript tapes somewhere to be printed. Mm. Um, I I used the display. I mean, I could easily see my 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 mnemonic code on the on the screen, and it was easy enough to correct that. Of course, I had I had handwritten stuff out um, for changing things and correcting things, and you know, writing out programs. But I never actually printed anything that I recall. But uh, but there were people, some of, the, some of the research in the field, they had teletypes and they wanted to be able to print, print some sometimes data, sometimes mm. manuscripts of their program manuscripts. Um, yes, there was a print man, you, you've, <laughs> you know more about this than I do because <laughs> sure I, I have not reviewed the, that recently, but the, there was a print manuscript command that worked for lap six that worked with the teletype type. Maybe they all, all three did. I don't know. There was a print binary, which I guess mm. just printed binary code, so which was maybe helpful for debugging in some cases, although I usually just stepped through it with the lights and the switches. Um, and there was uh, this list, which I think, as you say, well, you said it, just it listed Well, how would that have been? It might have been. It just listed maybe the code. But I don't. I don't. How would I don't remember how that was different mm. from a print binary. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of us have read the manual yeah. lately. <laughs> um, I wondered. At, well, as a kind of a follow-on to that question, I wondered if were you. Were you developing like the documentation for um, for the operating system? Were you were you using the link editor to write the documentation, like no. the the handbook, or no? No, okay. no, no, no. We 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 had 
you know, old-fashioned handwritten documents and secretaries who typed <laughs> Okay. <laughs> on old-fashioned typewriters. We didn't, I don't think we even had electric typewriters then. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, no, that was all longhand. Theoretically, with lap six, you could use lap six to write anything. The display held at most 256 characters, but if you put anything close to 200, remember that word flicker? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you couldn't, you, you, you wouldn't be able to read it because it was this, the computer and the display at that stage were, were not sophisticated enough or fast enough right. to display a lot of text. Right. Uh, people did use it for short text things. But no, all the documentation I did, and it was considerable, uh, was done longhand. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I wonder if we could talk about um, your move to St. Louis when you decided to, to join the, the group. Mm -hmm. um, could you just talk about when that was and your thinking about... Um, about finally deciding to make the move yeah. to St. Louis, yeah. something that I think you have previously yeah. resisted somewhat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, yeah, I had spent 1964 traveling around the world, and I came back in late, in late, no, well, mid-November mid of 64, and I spent most of 65 in Baltimore at my parents' house writing Lap 6. Um, and I don't know the date anymore that I went to St. moved to St. Louis, but I think it was late in '65. Um, and I eventually decided by that by that time we had lap six being used by well we called it lap five. This beta version was lap five. That was being used by uh, a number of people in the St. Louis laboratories, the computer systems laboratory and the biomedical computer laboratory. I think it hadn't yet been distributed to all those biomedical researchers. I was still still working on it, I think. Any event, so um, I, may, I finally made the decision to move to St. Louis. I mean, I thought, I, okay, time to... I, I didn't have any particular, yen, sorry, MIT, to come back to MIT. <laughs> Perhaps I could have, but the, the interesting work was in St. Louis. And I did realize by that time that I had been lucky with my assignment to this group because it was doing such advanced work and that although I enjoyed the work I was doing, I, I was pretty sure I didn't want to go be a programmer and for some corporation or... I, I was interested in the, um, the experimental aspects of the work mm -hmm. and, the, and the cutting edge aspects of the work. And there were only a few places that were doing that. And uh, one was, of course, St. Louis. And I, so, I, so I moved to St. Louis. How had the the composition of the the link team that had been together um, in Cambridge? How had that changed? Had that changed significantly in the shift to St. Louis? Were there new additions? Mm -hmm. Did, uh, mm -hmm. Had people left? Mm -hmm. What was what was that? No, like? it changed considerably. There were by the time. Um, well, let's say at the end of '64, which is really my last uh, before, which is when I left on my big long trip, the group in, uh, here in Cambridge uh, had grown considerably. I think there were maybe 20, 25 of us in the group at that point, um, which is people who had been hired to do, do the whole link evaluation program and get through that summer of 63. I'm sorry, I left in the, I left in late 63, not 64. <laughs> um, and I left the day after, the day after Kennedy's funeral, hmm. November 63. 
as it turned out. Anyway, so the, that group had grown quite a bit. And uh, of, of that group, only about, I think, five of us went to St. Louis, including some key people. I mean, Wesley went, and it was a whole negotiation that went on about where they were going to go after MIT decided, you know, after the falling out, let's say, with MIT. Right. Um, and so Wesley and some of the others had gone visiting various universities and medical schools to see, you know, what might work out. And Washington University had been very welcoming, and largely through the efforts of uh, George Paik, who was then the provost at Washington University, and Jerry Cox, who was an, uh, an engineer at Washington University, who himself was doing some biomedical engineering, had been, and was looking for online capabilities to do some of the work he was doing. So he and Wesley and the Link were a natural match, and he very much wanted the Link group to come to St. Louis. And so that's where we fit the best. So some of the key people went, Wesley, Charlie Molnar, who had been our really chief engineer, and this brilliant engineer, a fellow named Tom Sandel, who had been instrumental in helping define uh, some of the prospective applications um, in psychology, I think, primarily. Charlie was also knowledgeable in physiology. Um, and, and those were three of the key people. Bill Papian, who had been running our whole group, he went to St. Louis. Severo Ornstein went to St. Louis. I eventually went to St. Louis. Um, a fellow named Michelle Stuckey, who was also one of the logic designers for the link, along with Severo. Um, he, he joined us in St. Louis, he and his wife. Um, may have left out somebody, but whatever that was. And then, as the group grew in St. Louis, we added people there. So there were, and some of those people were very instrumental as the years went on in not only furthering the link development, um, but they became involved, of course, in the macromodular research, which was the next big project in St. Louis. Well, that's uh, just exactly what I wanted to... Well, um, I wanted to just exactly ask about the, the macromodule um, project and how that related to the next steps for the link. Um, but before that, could you maybe describe... Um, what your facilities were like for the group at St. Louis, you know, just physically, what your where you were <laughs> and and um, what sort of uh, resources you had to to conduct your work, whether it was you know other computer resources or financial resources. Um, just uh, if you could paint a little picture, if you sure. will. Sure. Yeah. Well, like. the financial resources uh, were picked up by NIH. They followed Wesley, um, and so we were funded by NIH quite handsomely for the next several years. And um, the physical, they shopped around for a space. I'm trying to think whether uh, they were already in the, I forget when they moved into the space that we ended up in. I think what they looked at spaces near the medical school and Jerry Cox, but what was going to happen was that Wesley was going to set up a biomedic, uh, a computer, what became the computer systems laboratory, and Jerry Cox was going to set up a sort of a sister laboratory, which was called the Biomedical Computing Laboratory, mm -hmm. which is more focused on applications. Um, and so... What they found eventually was, I believe it was a former nurse's residence building. Uh, I think that's what it was, uh, very near the medical school. And as I under, I didn't see it in that in its shape then because I, they moved in sometime in the summer of '64, I think, when I was still traveling, and they. Um, 
and I, I gather I, I gather the building was in terrible shape when they got mm -hmm. it. But by the time I first saw it, it had all been divvied up neatly into conference rooms and little offices and that sort of thing. So we had perfectly comfortable, not not luxurious, not very elaborate, but perfectly comfortable, good working space. We did not. Um, we didn't have any big computers around. We just had links, mm -hmm. and Jerry was using links in his lab. And he had he Jerry did Jerry's just about to publish a quite wonderful book, oh. his memoir, um, which I have been fortunate enough to have read an advanced copy of, and uh, he did an, an enormous amount of uh, of mentoring of graduate students, doing all kinds of different biomedical applications um, with the link. He was quite instrumental in advancing biomedical computing research just by himself. I mean, just right there at Washington University. And there were a couple others out there of those original 12 links. There was a fellow at the University of Wisconsin. When he got his link, he immediately began to convert the whole medical school to biomedical computing and using these online computers mm -hmm. and much much as Jerry was doing at Washington University it was it was a fun time because it was fascinating to just watch it take off like that and for you personally you became a a, a member of the the staff of was it the university or the medical school where where did you set I don't remember. I do remember, I don't know if we went into this last time, at MIT I had, I had originally been a technician. Mm -hmm. Did we go in, did no. we cover that? Okay. Um, as, a, as a woman, <laughs> as a woman, I was a, pro, I was a programmer. That was, you know, I was not a logic designer. Uh, the men did the logic design and the women did the programming, and all the programmers I knew at Lincoln Laboratory were women. Hmm. Uh, the men, however, all had slots on the general research staff here at MIT. And there was a limited number of general research staff slots, uh, so the men had general research staff slots. I was categorized as a technician, uh, which meant uh, lower pay and fewer benefits and and so forth. That all, and it meant pretty much that you went and worked where you were assigned. I mean, you could. There was some negotiating, of course, but you pretty much, you know. And that's how I ended up in Wesley's group mm -hmm. because I was sent there. Right. You know, I didn't know to apply for it, uh, but in any event, and it, as it turned out, the group was very hard to get into if you were a guy. <laughs> Severo took Severo Ornstein a long time to get in. <laughs> I said, what's your problem? They just sent me here. I'm here. <laughs> anyway, it was an interesting dichotomy, but it was totally typical of the times. But it, 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 as far as the MIT situation was concerned, Wesley and Bill Papian had gone to bat for me and gotten me a, a slot here on the general research staff. So before I left MIT, I had my general research staff slot, so I was on a par with the guys, uh, which was, of course, as it should be. Yeah. Um, and I don't, to come back to what happened at Washington University, I don't remember what happened to those of us who were on the staff, but I think we were all on the same, in the same category, whatever it was. Um, the principals, Wesley and Tom Sandel, and Bill, they, all, they had professorships. I think Wesley had a couple of them. Um, and that, but it, anyway. Okay. Um, well, when you uh, when you got to um, when you got to St. Louis and and settled into the group, what was what was the direction that the group was taking um, specifically with respect to the links? What was the next chapter for Link? The next chapter for the link was, as I recall, was pretty much the applications work that was going on out in the field and 
Um, I had, let me see, I moved there in the, toward the end of 65. I still had, I was the one who had the follow-up work at that point with the link. Um, whatever questions, I think lap six, lap five was certainly used in 1966 at Washington University. Um, that was the, the prototype, the beta. And then it was finally released, I think, now you see, I'm going to look at this. <laughs> if please, you don't do, mind, I don't want to get do. these dates wrong again. <laughs> um, all right, I... The Lap 6 Handbook was released, is dated May of 1967. And whether Lap 6 itself, Lap 6, we just renamed it. We took, I think, I think probably what was happening was that there were occasional bugs with Lap 5 mm -hmm. that we had to fix so to be really sure that somebody didn't have a slightly earlier version. We just, the final that we settled on, that I settled on, I just named, renamed it Lap 6. Uh, so that if it wasn't named Lap 6, I wasn't responsible for it, you know, <laughs> and then that's the one we sent out. Uh, so I don't remember, I, d I don't think I would have sent that out before I had a handbook, because I don't know what you would have done with it. Right. Uh, but whether there were draft handbooks, I might have sent draft handbooks to people who but anyway, regardless, it was sometime around in there. And so I was doing that. I was also writing the second, the first edition of Programming the Link, the programming manual, what had, what was, you know, that had come out in 1962. And that was before we even had a final order code or even the key codes on the, on the keyboard changed right. <laughs> after after that one, so we badly needed a new edition of programming the link, and that came out in sixty programming the link second edition january sixty seven uh, and then I wrote a couple of journal articles about all of, you know, all of this work. Right. Um, and we also maintained for a while, I maintained for a while, a bibliography of link-related publications in the scientific fields. We just asked all these researchers if they published, if they were publishing research articles in, in, which, it, in which the research had involved using a link to do some of the research if they would let us, you know, have citations to the research. And the first year we did that, um, you know, we got maybe about 50, and then it started just doubling and quadrupling. And uh, I finally, and, and I, I just thought it was kind of a good thing to do. And it turned out later on, you know, as the years went by, People said, do we still have that bibliography of link-related publication? I said, we sure do. So in any event, people have, looked, have used it more since then than nobody was actually using the bibliography. I said, somebody's going to want to know this someday. Yeah. So there was that I was doing. I mean, it didn't take a lot of work on my part. And we finally had to abandon it because it was just, there, were, it, there was too much stuff. Yeah, but... Yeah, so I, I was, the, the others were mostly doing, getting, and I believe, involved in the macromodular work uh, that was starting, and I eventually took that up late 60s. Mm -hmm. Was it, well, let's, let's maybe talk a little bit about the macromodular project. We touched on it a little bit when we last spoke, um, the idea of a, you know, modular computer that you could, you know, uh, pick your functions and yeah. and uh, plug them together and 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 have a and have a kind of a customized machine and all of the the novelties that that yeah. entailed. Um, but before we kind of dive into that, 
I wondered if it was like, was the macromodular computer going to be sort of the successor to the link? No. 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 Okay. No. It was a completely new departure. I mean, it was the successor in the in philosophy, if you will, okay. in a way, because this was also a hands-on way of using computational tools. Mm-hmm. Uh, being able to take building blocks and if you needed three add components, for example, for some thing, you could have three add components, bo- you know, boxes. I mean, these were little, literally physical boxes. Um, and combine them as you saw fit for your own applications. So in that sense, it was... Um, part of the same philosophy, a related philosophy. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the same philosophy. It didn't per se have anything to do with biomedical research. Although Charlie Molnar, who, who um, inherited the project and the, and the leadership of the laboratory after we moved back to Cambridge, but I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, Charlie did did do a, he and his graduate students did a lot of macromodular projects, uh, and I can't really tell you exactly what they were, mm. but they did use they built macromodules and they used the macromodules. And it was never a commercial success, um, but it did advance a lot. There was a lot of new technology that went into them that was applicable in the work that other people came along and did afterwards. One mm-hmm. of the unique things about the macromodules that made, I, I eventually ended up designing the multiply macromodule. Um, and now you'd think you need to build a box that logically multiplies, that's, you know, how hard can that be? The macromodules were asynchronous, that is to say, they did not have internal an internal clock, so if you you never knew what time it was <laughs> when you were inside the macro module, you know was the was the uh, operand really there or not there? Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's no clock to look at to tell you it's not it's three o'clock. The operand must be here. Uh, no, you had so the asynchronous logic I found very challenging. And the macromodular set, it's, that was the most complex of the whole set. I, I, the others were things like add, and I suppose if then, or and or, and some logic functions, and I honestly don't remember. There was, there was a whole AFIPS proceeding, I mean literally this thick, right. of a, a whole AFIPS, I mean several dozen articles on the entire macromodule development and project at Washington University. But I haven't read it. (laughs) Well, um, and that was supported by, that project was not supported by the NIH, but was supported by ARPA, is that correct? I think you're right. Okay. You know more about it than I do, I I think. I I know a little bit about it, but through an interview with that I helped conduct with um, Ivan Sutherland, of course. who I think yes. Yes. was supporting the project. Yes, yes, yes. And to this day yes. still supports yes. asynchronous Well, I, Ivan, has car- Ivan has continued his work with asynchronous logic. I think, I think he's still involved with it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, he... Wesley was a big influence on Ivan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, uh, I guess the, the question I wanted to ask was with this, with the macromodule, uh, project kind of gaining steam and, you know, your continued work kind of on the applications and the software side of the link, um, I was wondering if the group felt like responsible for making the next step in biomedical computing, having cracked it open, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. did you feel like you needed to create a next system to meet the demands of the users or 
Did you feel that was in the hands of Deck, who was like making links, I guess, at this point? Yeah, yeah. Uh, more the latter, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, the, um, I mean, that certainly would have been a direction in which one could go, but I think that a transition to that focus would have required almost more of a corporate setting yeah. where you could make some money and support people. I don't know how long you could have gotten that funded right. by the government. I mean, this was a time, the link was done at a time of very informed, intelligent, in my opinion, government-sponsored research mm -hmm. in which, you know, you put money into things like the link because you could see why that was going to be important. And there were lots of projects like that in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. Not so much today. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it would have been, but Deck was, Deck was already making the links. And it, um, the, it, in fact, the link tapes became Deck tapes. And the Deck tapes were used on a lot of their machines for several years, many years. And some of the other some of the other deck machines were basically links in disguise. I mean, they were they morphed into other deck machines. So deck was already there, I see. doing that. And uh, yeah, it wasn't wasn't something. I it wouldn't have. It's not something that Wesley, I think, would have wanted been interested in doing. He was always looking for something completely new, completely outside the box, outside the envelope, whatever you want to call right. it. Right, you know? right, pushing forward, and that's, yeah, yeah. expanding what a computer could be yeah. in yeah. a way. Yeah. yeah, okay, that makes sense to me. It would be, it would not have been a university research project to no. necessarily to yeah. do that next system. Yeah. I see. Um, well, let's see. Um, so could you could you talk a little bit about how you you know transitioned into working on that multiply module for the macro module project and you know how did you how did you learn about asynchronous logic and and how you would <laughs> design something for that I mean there weren't uh, were there other groups working on it not that I was aware of right no. No, I was like, how did you learn about it? How, I think you asked me before, how did I learn to do whatever it was? Yeah. <laughs> you, you just did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ivan has a wonderful line. No, when I asked, I asked him that question once about Sketchpad, you know, how, how did you? He said, nobody told me it was hard. <laughs> Great line. Well, that's how I felt about it. And later, afterward, and you know, nobody told me it was hard. You just did what you had to do. No, the I found the asynchronous logic, as I said, very challenging, and there wasn't, to my knowledge, any way to study it. Um, the guys in the lab, like Severo and Charlie and so forth, who had been who had been designing the other macro module uh, macro modules, um, I don't think they had as much trouble with it. But I don't think it was as hard as the multiplier. Mm. And so there's that, and I, I once had, in fact, a funny conversation about it with Ivan <laughs> many years later, and I said, you know, I found that very hard. He said, well, what was the big deal? <laughs> I said, Ivan, I'm sure for you it wouldn't have been any kind of a deal. <laughs> yeah. Kind of an unfair <laughs> metric. I mean, so yeah. it was asynchronous, so what? <laughs> Anyway, I finally got it done, and it worked perfectly, but uh, it took a while. How did I get on to that? Um, I had observed <laughs> right from the beginning at, at MIT, at, here at MIT, at Lincoln, um, that although I was doing the programming and the guys were doing the logic design, that in fact, what, what I was doing, what each of us was doing required the same set of mental aptitudes or whatever, what have you. And I said, I could do that. They could do this. And they could, and they did if they had to, they programmed, but they didn't, wasn't their careers the way it was mine. Mm -hmm. They could do programming. Um, so I had said to Wesley 
I think fairly early on that at some point I would like to try my hand at doing some of the logic design just for a change. Um, and of course, it didn't, that really wasn't possible during the link development because A, I was the programmer. <laughs> and we needed a programmer. Right. <laughs> so I didn't really have any time to take that on. Uh, but with the macromodular, when, so I brought it up again when I got to St. Louis and said, I, I would, I'd I like to get involved in this macromodule. He said, fine, do the multiplier. So <laughs> I said, sure, boss. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have in my notes that, um, that uh, the, the macromodule project may have related to um, some concepts from Gertrude Estrin, have you heard about that? That does not ring a bell yeah. with me. Yeah. Okay. She, I guess she was at, would have been at UCLA at this time or something. I'll have to ferret that out. There, there are others way. who would might know, but not, okay, I'm not one of them. Um. And let's see. And um, I know one thing that uh, there's this issue in, I think there's this issue in asynchronous, or maybe it's in digital logic, the stability glitch. Was that uh, something that was addressed in asynchronous logic, something that asynchronous logic avoided? Um, or maybe a flip-flop got stuck in an unstable state? Um, that oh the glitch phenomenon yeah, this... yeah the glitch phenomenon no I think the glitch phenomenon was first observed in um, with the links oh as I recall okay oh boy um now I don't think I should go any further okay. than that. <laughs> but the, but just the 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 notion of this glitch was that it was a condition that could sometimes arise in digital logic. And it still can, as I understand it. But I'm the wrong person to ask about okay. that. Okay. Fair enough. Um, was it... Now, um, you had, of course, known Ivan Sutherland um, previously as a fellow TX2 user. Um, oh, I Ivan, are you saying? Ivan Sutherland, yes. Ivan, yes, yes. If I'm, Sorry if I said the wrong thing. No, I um, just can't. Oh, yeah. Wasn't, I was mumbling. Um, you had known Ivan Sutherland earlier as a TX2, fellow TX2 user. When he was supporting the macro module project in St. Louis, did you, um, would he visit the group and, uh, and um, kind of check on how things were developing or... Was he was he at all a, a presence there? Yes, but I can't give you any specific times. Okay. Yeah. Well, one thing that I know that uh, many people who um, in this era who had projects supported by ARPA talk about you know this ARPA community and you know all the people who had ARPA contracts right. kind of interacting and getting together right. was that um, was that part of your experience or part of the group's experience um, I know we were always in close contact with the ARPA people and before it was Larry Roberts for a while and it was Ivan uh, and who else was it ARPA? Maybe Bob Taylor? Oh, Bob Taylor, yes, of course. Um, Bob was very active. I don't... I, when you say, did we get together, we didn't get together like for reunions with ARPA people that I remember, which we did with Link, with Link people. Um, but, but we were certainly in frequent contact with them. I knew all those people pretty well. I okay. Mean, there were the I think these contractors meetings that maybe were annual. Yeah, I wouldn't have probably been involved in a meeting of. I mean, the, that would have been like one person from our group might go maybe, or something yeah, like that. Maybe yeah, that's true. Um, 
let's see. Um, I this may be <clears throat> this may be jumping ahead too far. So tell me if I'm leapfrogging something. Right, I am on my sheet. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can get the our cheat get the right dates. <laughs> um, well, I, I did see something that was fascinating to me. It was that um, in 1968, software became patentable. And there was a movement to extend copyright protection to software as well. Um, and in, I think it was in 1970, the now former Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer wrote an article, The Uneasy Case for Copyright in Books, Photocopies, and Computer Programs in the Harvard Law Review. And then I think you wrote a report in 1971 called The Case for Copyright. I did, I could, did. Could, could you just um, <laughs> tell me about what was going on and your thinking about it? I absolutely no idea that <laughs> Stephen Breyer had written an article about oh. it the year before <laughs> I did. I could have saved my trouble, saved the trouble. I thought it was like a response to it. <laughs> no. no, oh, okay. Not at all. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I will have to go read that article. No, I wrote an internal memo at Washington University called The Case for Copyright because, um, 71, you say? 71, I <laughs> okay. think. I think so. <laughs> that sounds about right. Um, because uh, by that time, Lap 6 had been out for a while, and people were making changes to it. And I would get the calls because then it wouldn't work. <laughs> I said, you know, there's got to be a better way to protect. You put years of work into something like Lap 6, mm. and you work very hard to get the bugs out of it. And you send it out to people, and you describe it, and it's supposed to do exactly, perform exactly as you describe it, and then all of a sudden it doesn't. And it's because somebody has changed the program. And I said, this is, this is not only annoying, <laughs> but it's dangerous mm. in that if you have programs running in a biomedical environment that are dependent on the software, um, I don't think I told you the story of the brain surgeon there, yeah, well... <laughs> Um, if you have programs and then they don't work, uh, you, you're possibly, you know, I mean, any event, I was very concerned about it. And so I had gotten interested, and I was also beginning to think again, maybe about going to law school, which had been my high school dream. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll just look into this. So... I did a little bit of reading about copyright, not very much, and I wrote the memo. And I talked to a few people, as I recall, at Washington University and maybe in the legal department, I don't know, I uh, don't remember now, about whether there was a way we could copyright or patent uh, the, some of the key system software mm. associated with the link. And they pointed out correctly that no, first of all, they were, it was government-sponsored research, which is public domain. <laughs> oh, <laughs> legal lesson number one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, the, and university, was on, it was university housed, but not university sponsored. And so it was really not possible to do that with the link. Right. The link software, but I had gotten I had gotten interested in it, and I and I thought of pursuing that briefly in law school. I decided not to, but yeah, I'll have to look up the good yeah. Justice Breyer's <laughs> article now that I know about it. <laughs> I'll send you the reference. Um, so, what was the story about the brain surgeon that you just read? Oh, the brain surgeon. Well, he was Sid Goldring. He was one of the first uh, of those twelve in the link evaluation program, and he was right there at Washington University Medical School, in fact. And he was a practicing brain surgeon, and in fact, we watched him operate one day. The first thing he did, well, one of the first things he did with his link, to our somewhat 
dismay was reel it right into the operating room. Mm. I mean, when we were talking about biomedical research, you know, we were talking about monkeys pushing buttons. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he recognized right away that he could use this to monitor the brain waves of patients while he was operating on them. This, this technology, we did not have that technology then. Mm. And so he actually had the link right in the operating room, hooked up to patients so that he could see what was happening as, and, and maybe change or what he was doing, depending on what he saw on the link display. Mm. And I remember sitting there in the amphitheater, you know, you always sat up really high. <laughs> Just going, oh my God. <laughs> it was it was heart stopping. But he happily went on, used the link for many years. Mm. Uh, and I think he's one of the ones who complained of the research. He was doing a lot of research in addition. And on, he said that the research he'd planned to do that he thought was going to take him 10 years was now only going to take him one because he had the link in <laughs> What was he going to do? I've heard that story told about two or three different of the researchers, but I think he was one of them. So that really underscored these issues about, yeah. you know, the sure. reliability of sure. the system. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Well, we had we also had a little bit, some of our funding, not a great amount, but some of our funding for the link came from NASA. Right. Because NASA was interested in small computers that they could put on board spaceships. Well, if this is your computer on board your spaceship, it better be reliable. <laughs> right. And it better be what you debug. Right. Um, okay. Um, well, uh, I wanted to I wanted to ask you about um, well, unless I've missed some something between the asynchronous logic <laughs> and <laughs> macromodules and the and the copyright um, case. The next kind of thing I wanted to ask you about was your trip to China in 1972. Oh, wow, um, yeah. Is yeah. there, ha, yeah. have I missed another, something else that you were working Look on? Look at mine. Oh, please do. <laughs> I don't think anything major, but let me check. I went. I did go part time um, at Washington University my last year or so there because I was. I had somewhere along in 1970, 71 decided to go to law school at some point. Um, and uh, so I went part time and took a few courses so I could take a couple of other courses and just gently lighten my workload, which mm. had been pretty heavy up to that point. But that otherwise, otherwise I was on the payroll there right until the end of August 72. Yeah. And yes, we went to China. Uh, could you could you describe how that trip came about and and uh, and what that was like because it's a I mean such an early yeah yeah trip very early um, Nixon had gone to China in I think March February or March of seventy two and that was the big breakthrough between the United States and China and we didn't we didn't even have embassies you know no Chinese embassy here or no U S embassy there. Uh, and but Severo Ornstein of our group had been wanting to go to China for his own reasons uh, for a, a while, and he'd been trying to figure out a way to do that. Mm -hmm. And he'd been working with a contact he had made at the Chinese embassy in Ottawa, in Canada. And he finally, what he finally did, was to. Uh, uh, he put together a list of about 18 computer scientists. We didn't call ourselves computer scientists in those days, but that's what they would be called. Now, 
And he put together a list of about 18 and um, started calling around to see who might be interested in going to China and his way of getting people to sign on was, um, he would say to the first one, you know, would you like, you know, do you want to go to, tell him his plan was, do you want to go to China? And they would invariably say, well, who else is going? So he would just name somebody else on the list <laughs> and we say, oh, okay, well, sign me up. <laughs> he tell, He's told me many, that's what he says he did all the way through the list. So he got this big list. And through his contact in Ottawa, he finally got invited in sometime earlier. In, we went in July. He got invited in, early, I don't know, not too much, not too much longer before we went, maybe three or four months. Mm. Got invited to bring six computer scientists. And so then he put it to the group, all these people who had accepted. <laughs> I mean, they knew it wasn't a sure thing. He didn't, he didn't mislead them that right. way, that badly. But <laughs> anyway, so they voted on, on who to send. I was not on that list. I, by that time, I was married to Wesley Clark. And Wesley, of course, was on the list. So the group... Um, uh, voted, and Severo said, I'm definitely going, so you have to vote on the other five. And so they ranked each other, uh, and Wesley was one of the other five. And at the very last, and they, they were, the group was all men, I mean, at that point, as that was how it was in those days. So, uh, but at the very last minute, in, like, we left, I think, the day after the 4th of July or something like that mm. in 72. And I think I didn't hear until maybe the week before um, that the wives were invited. And so um, we, we were in the process of moving. Oh, by this time, of course, I had applied to all these law schools and I was going to start law school on September 1. 72. Oh so gosh. we were moving from St. Louis back to Cambridge, and Wesley was going to go to China, and I was going to stay in St. Louis with the happy job of packing and getting us moved to Cambridge while he was off ha having this wonderful trip. Anyway, so there we were, and we had no, we weren't ready to move to Cambridge by a long shot. And then the, so the week before we get the word, wives are invited. Well, I had to get a pa I had to get a visa. I had to get we had it was a scramble, but I went. Wow. Uh, and so did Severo. At that point, was divorced, so he was not accompanied by a wife. But the but all five of the others did bring their wives. So we were a group of eleven, and poor Charlie Molnar was left with the job of packing up our apartment in St. Louis <laughs> <laughs> and getting it. I think he put it in storage until we, until we came back. I had to I had to go through Senator Danforth, I think, to get the visa, or whatever. I or maybe they, it all also involved the embassy in, to in sure. wherever it was Toronto or Ottawa right. or something. Any event, we got there. So yeah, there were there were eleven of us, six of the computer scientists, and we spent eighteen days uh, in China visiting. Um, their their computer laboratories and their computer factories, they called them. And it was a fascinating, fascinating trip because Westerners, there, there were some Westerners in Beijing, in Peking it was called then, because the French, I think, had maintained an embassy there. There was a, like an embassy compound for mm. foreigners. But Many of the younger generations had never seen a Caucasian face, so we created quite a uh, stir. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was reading the the article that you kindly sent me, the copy of the oh, article yeah. that you uh, wrote um, based off the diary, your travel diary right. that you were keeping, right. and. Um, uh, it it really seems like uh, that the group was impressed um, by the 
the advances that the Chinese um, yes. had been able to take in in such a short amount of time. Yes. And yes. essentially, you know, doing each element relatively autonomously from yeah. components yeah. to yeah. software. Yeah. Um, so was that was that they, the general it, impression? It was it was astonishing. The Chinese had become masters at reverse engineering. They had reverse engineered some of the most complex computers of the time and then built them themselves. They were not doing so much, they weren't doing the innovative work that you could see here that people like Wesley and Ivan Sutherland and others were doing. They weren't doing that, but they were um, creating a big industry in China out of re, uh, uh, reverse engineered and, and, and built computers. They even had one computer, I think, called the 709. <laughs> and uh, how, you know, whether it was exactly duplicate, I don't know, but I'll bet it, it could have, they could have done that. That's, that was how, how good they were. And uh, they were, so it was fascinating from that standpoint because they were very, it seems as though when the Chinese set out to do something, they do it, and everybody is marshaled to do it. Right? There's a joke, I think, in that article about the flies, about how we saw five flies, and that Wesley and I each killed one. We took responsibility because Mao had a campaign to kill all the flies in China. Oh, I didn't know. And he set all the Chinese to killing all the flies. And sure enough, we didn't, except for those five, we didn't see any flies. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anything else really stand out in particular from that trip, or or the the meaning of that 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 trip had for you? I mean, it seems um, the point there. We were our rooms were bugged in the hotels, which was sort of fascinating, and not and and not very cleverly bugged. I mean, <laughs> not bug not not that we could see the equipment, but. You, you know, a child, one of uh, we, we each couple had a car, an interpreter, and a driver. So our interpreter or somebody would ask the next would say to somebody, "How's your cold this morning?" <laughs> 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 or I'm sorry, you didn't sleep very well last night. <laughs> How did they know that? There were some dead giveaways like yeah. that. I don't remember exactly what they were, but we did. We picked up on that pretty quickly. Um, the other thing, of course, was that if you, I, we were supposed to take a siesta in the middle of the day, and of course I was having none of that. So I would, and they did, really didn't want us to go out walking around by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know whether it was because they were afraid we might observe something they didn't want us to observe, or whether they were literally concerned for our safety. But mm. in any event, I would use my siesta time to go out walking by myself. And the problem with that is that you drew huge, huge crowds of people who just stared at you. Mm. It could be very You had to keep moving. If you stopped to look in a window or something, you, the crowds would get to be instantly just wow. get to be huge right around you. So that was a, that was a little disconcerting, but uh, that it, it was. I, I, the, all the Chinese we met were wonderfully friendly and welcoming and hospitable, and quite um, quite um, relaxed in a way. I mean, they didn't seem they didn't you didn't get the impression that they were. Uh, suffering under the burdens of an authoritarian regime. Uh, they were enthusiastic about their work. They were, um, as I say, they were helpful. They were, they were f fully functioning, you know, mm. at a very high level. Yeah. Well, um, Maybe we could talk a little bit about your, uh, the move that you made when you came back to the U.S. Um, to, uh, to go to Harvard Law School. Um, and it, w you both moved to Cambridge. So was that, um, was that uh, did Wesley Clark hand over the, 
the kind of uh, management of the laboratory to Charlie Molnar? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And and what was what was he going to or what were his plans for what he was? He going just to became do? an independent consultant, um, and uh, he and that's what he did for he that's what he did for the rest of his life. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And he, never went back to academia. He had said when he went to St. Louis, which had been in '64, he had told George Pake that he would. I think he said three years that he would give it three years. Because he did not, he he wanted to come back to Cambridge, or maybe to the West Coast where he was from, uh, but he did not want to stay in St. Louis. And of course, he ended up being there eight, eight years. Mm. Uh, so we collaborated on where we would go, and I applied to law schools that were in communities where he there was some. Uh, activity. I mean, there, here there was MIT at Michigan. There was the University of Michigan in California. There was Caltech, and there were others. You know, right. places like that. So that pretty much guided my choice of schools to apply to. And he consulted just for not just for he consulted for computer manufacturers or sometimes for, sometimes he consulted did a lot of consulting over the years for Sun Microsystems for Ivan okay um, he did trying to think who, who else I, think, I know he had other consulting contracts nothing I'm blanking now okay um, well let's see. Um, well, could you tell me a little bit about um, what your experience was like at Harvard Law School? And um, and I guess it must have occurred then, sort of a gravitation toward trial law. No, that had started in in, in high school. I don't know. Did I tell you that? Oh, going I think to I the, visiting before. the Supreme Court? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yes. You yes. Did yes. Tell me so, that. Um, and when I finally decided to go to law school, which was a, I guess the decision was 1970 or 71. Um, I, um, I, I had lost my train of thought. Anyway, I, I still wanted to be a trial lawyer. I wanted okay. to be a courtroom lawyer. And I had said to myself, I don't care, I'm going to go do it anyway. You know, by this time I'm 12 years older, I'm more mature. <laughs> if I have to be a pioneer, I'll be a pioneer, you know, but, you know, anyway. So I was going to go be a trial lawyer. But so, yeah, that was my, that was my, as I said earlier, I kind of flirted with the idea of maybe doing something with patent law or copyright, but because of that interest. Uh, from the computer field, but I, that wasn't really where my interests lay. So yeah, I started Harvard Law School in the fall of 1972 uh, and graduated in 75 and worked as a practicing lawyer for the next 35, 40 years, yeah. Was what when you got to Harvard Law School in those in that period? What was it like in terms of the the gender dynamic? Was it was it a, another almost exclusively male environment? Or yeah, or? it had it had improved somewhat. Um, it was it, I think my class was something like nine or ten percent women. I don't know what it would have been had I gone in. At right straight out of college, much, much lower. Right. Much, much lower. It was beginning to open up, but we were still a long way. It's now over 50%. That's good to yeah. hear. <laughs> but also, Harvard was not the first one to let women, to admit women. I think Michigan or one of those places was one of the first, was much more open minded than Harvard mm. was. Mm. <laughs> Did that, um, do you feel that there was any, um, well, were you uh, battling against um, sexism at all during your your education at the law school? Depended or? on who the professor was. Case by case. Some of them were 
some of them made it obvious. <laughs> some of them were, but didn't make it obvious, and some of them weren't sexist. Right. So it just depended on who, you know. There were beginning to be a few women professors. Again, not many. Now there are a lot, and now they've had at least two deans of the law school who were women. Right. So, you know, a lot has happened in the last 50 years or so. Well, when you when you graduated in seventy five, um, did you did you first go into the public sector and then into private practice? No, first went into private sector. Private yeah, sector, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, could you could you um, talk about kind of the arc of your? Yeah, your I work? Wor I went I worked for a large law firm in Boston uh, for six or seven years right out of law school in the litigation department. Um, and it was all civil litigation, not criminal litigation. And that was fine, but you don't, civil case, you don't, I didn't get as much trial work as I wanted. And uh, civil cases don't try very often, in fact. I mm -hmm. mean, not nearly as often as criminal cases. They settle or they, whatever. Uh, so I, uh, and it, 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 it's a high, very high pressure environment, but any, any event, um, then I, uh, I ran for Cambridge City Council in, I'm going to say 1980 or 81, something like that, and through that I met Scott Harshbarger, who was running for district attorney of Middlesex County. And he was elected. I was not. <laughs> uh, but I then, I then started working with him. I, on his, I worked, first worked for him on his transition and uh, was head of his, his hiring, screening, and Hiring. I mean, he did the hiring, but uh, screening it was called the Screening and Hiring Committee. So I ran that during the transition, and then I said, "I, I, I would like to recommend myself." For you. <laughs> <laughs> I've screened myself thoroughly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm thoroughly vetted. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so he, uh, so I was hired by him when he went in for his first term as district attorney. So then I was in the DA's office for three years, I think three, most of his first term. And I loved that job. I loved that job. It was, it, I, I loved being a prosecutor. I, I created and ran his economic crime hmm. division, bureau, the bureau, whatever you want to call it. Um, and w there hadn't been one before, so I did that. And I loved that and got to try a lot of cases. Uh, and we had, I didn't have hardly anybody working for me. Occasionally I could get one of the uh, other DAs who was trying street crimes to do a, do a white collar crime with me or for me. And so I had a few people who were helping out with the trial load. We put, maybe, we were putting. I was putting about 300 cases a year through the grand jury. Oh my God! Just um, that's there was a lot of white collar all all the all the um, things like employee employment employee embezzlement and bank fraud and that sort of thing frequently ended up in the district attorney's office instead of the U.S. attorney's office. Well, I won't go into spend a lot of time on the difference between the two. Um, but there was a lot of a lot of white collar crime mm. that came our way mm. once it was known that we had this division going. So that was a great job. It was uh, it was a lot of, a lot of work, long hours. But um, I I loved that job. That, that was I, your idea to start. No, that? no, that was his. Okay. He went in with a whole with a whole platform of what he called for his public protection bureau which included white collar crime, which was the biggest division, and arson and um, civil rights, hmm. um, discrimination cases, right. um, ethics violations, anyway. 
Well, I was going to ask if that was very unusual to have like a white collar crime, you know, section in a district attorney's office. Unfortunately, here here in Massachusetts, it is. But not so in it's other places. It's just funding. You know, it's wow. just funding. You know, they can't get enough money to really fund these offices. I went to a few conferences of, you know, white collar, you know, district attorney's conferences in the years I was in the office here. And I remember, for example, the Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia district attorney's office had a huge white collar crime. They had 20 or 30 people. Wow. And I thought, wow. <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? Then they had some career prosecutors, like the like the U.S. government does in career prosecutors in white collar crime, uh, which we don't have here in Massachusetts. We had a few career prosecutors on the street side doing murder cases and do you know wonderful trial lawyers, but they weren't doing white collar crime. It's too bad because there's there's enough white collar crime, to, and it frequently pays its way because if there's, you know, it it, it always involves money. So right. <laughs> if you can find the money, sometimes you can get some of it back, <laughs> pay for your investigator or your who at whatever. Um. So well, I wanted to ask you. You know, you have had that. Um, long-standing kind of desire, you know, to, to, uh, to be a trial attorney. Right. Um, do you remember, you know, what it was like for your first trial or, you know, the first, oh, sure. what, what was yeah. that like? Uh, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about well, that? Well, I, I've, I've had been fortunate at Harvard Law School. I, I joined the um, Legal Aid Bureau. And I had a good mentor there who took me through my first, um, you know, going to court, arguing a motion, doing a few things like that. So I'd had a little bit of courtroom experience before I got to my, that, the private law, I, that law firm I was at was Hale and Door. Um, so I'd had a little bit of that. But, uh, yeah, otherwise I, I I do remember that first day in court. I was just arguing a motion. It wasn't a trial. It wasn't a real trial. But did it? It well, when you really got into doing trials, did it live up? I mean, to your expectation? <laughs> I was loved it. it. Okay. I absolutely loved it. But it is really really hard. You know, um, it it's they say the law is a jealous mistress, and that especially applies to trial work because when you are preparing a case for trial first of all there's never you never are prepared <laughs> there's never a point where you can say okay i'm done um but uh because there's always more little rabbit holes to go down and more little end things to close off and so forth and so on so you and and the whole secret to good trial work is good preparation, and so mm. there's the preparation is 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 all consuming, and it's so you, you have very long hours. The adrenaline runs very high, and then when the trial is over, it's gone. So you have a lot of highs and a lot of not. I wouldn't when wasn't for me wasn't crashes, but there would always be a kind of a. The, you know, <laughs> recovery. <laughs> recovery period, yes, yeah. a recovery period. Um, but, but we had one of the advantages of being in the district attorney's office was that um, prosecutors don't bring cases unless they know they've got the evidence. Mm. You, they're talking about that now when they're you know when they're talking about whether charges can can or should be brought about against Trump or uh, Eric, you know, whoever, all this, his, his aides, what kind of a case do you have and can you really prove it? Um, and the, the, nice, the nice thing, if so, with, about white-collar crime is that there's paperwork. Mm. And uh, we used to call them paper cases, in fact. And if you have the paperwork to show the corruption or the fraud, um, you can prove your case. Right. And so we won every single case 
that we brought, because first of all, you use your discretion. If you don't have the proof, you just don't bring the case. Um, and uh, you don't indict it. You don't take it into the grand jury. Uh, and so that, I mean, that's, I think, partly what's going on with some of the, what's happening in Georgia. Yeah. With that, although that seems to be taking an awfully long time. Mm. But anyway, so uh, those were two things that you you kind of knew, you knew, you didn't kind of, you definitely knew exactly how to go about what you were doing mm -hmm. and whether you had gotten to the point where you had a triable case or not. And so that was... Um, I, I I like that part of it. I I liked all all of the part about being a prosecutor. It just sort of suited my I don't know my <laughs> my sense of justice. You know the idea. The oath you take is to do justice. Mm. It's not to win cases. It's to do justice. And I thought, oh, that's wonderful. That's <laughs> so high minded. <laughs> well, was it? Um... So was it after your time with as a prosecutor that you was that when you worked with Thermo Electron? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, I went from yes, I went from Scott Harshbarger's office to Thermo Electron, and then, and there I was in house counsel managing litigation. I stopped trying cases. I tried a couple more after that, but uh, but mostly I was managing litigation for. The thermal it was a big it was a pretty big conglomerate a lot of a lot of separate companies all over the country right so I had my fingers in a lot of pies and I wasn't trying them myself but I was hiring lawyers all over the country to, I did to an oral that. history interview with George Hotsopoulos. oh did you so oh I, I, well, wonderful I'm very familiar with yes. the thermo oh yes story. yes um, yes well I, my first office was right next to his in the old building that oh, we really? had. Oh, really? Yes, I know exactly where it is. That's, yes, uh, yes. that's where we did our interview. Right it at is. that intersection of 128, and I forget the other yeah. one that was right, right. there. Yes. Right, right. Yeah. Smelling very much like pipe smoke. <laughs> you yeah. know, he has oh, a whole... Yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh, Wonderful fellow. Um, was that mostly... Was, was the work you were doing at this time, which would have been... This was kind of during the peak times of them acquiring all of the other instrumentation yeah. companies. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a much smaller company when I joined them, which was in approximately 1982, I think. Okay. Uh, and I left there in 2001. Ooh, I don't think I was there that long. So maybe I... No, no, I left, I was in the DA's office for three years at least, so it would have been mid-80s that I went to Thermo Electron. Okay. Say 85, 86. Right. And, uh, yeah, and we were in that old, the old building, the much smaller building, and it was a much smaller company, and then they began acquiring a lot of companies. There was a lot of change while I, and I was there for about 16 years, and there was a lot of change while I was there. Um, George and his brother John, who was his right-hand man right. uh, running the company, both retired and new management came in, and of course that changed things a lot. Right. Yeah. Was there a lot of um, defending patents or defending yourself from Not much. From there patents? were some. Um, there was some, and it was mostly... Uh, trying to think. We had one huge patent case. I remember going to George at one point. There were so many millions of dollars at stake in this patent case, which we were defending, I think. And I finally went to George. I said, George, why don't we just buy this company? <laughs> and that would put an end to this litigation. This is costing us a fortune. And that that wasn't in the cards, but the company was Fisher Scientific. Oh. <laughs> and they merged with Fisher Scientific a few years later. There. Yeah, but that was that's the patent case I remember. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I would think inevitably that would happen. You have these two, you know, <laughs> though both of those two companies are buying up the entire yeah. scientific <laughs> instrument industry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Somebody's going to... Yeah, so, but I, I, I enjoyed the work very much. Eventually got to be too much mm. because there were just, instead of... I, at the point where I could not only hire the outside counsel, but also tell them what to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and really have my hand in supervising and a actually go to the arguments or or, or uh, review the briefs before they were filed and, and participate in the strategy thinking and all that, which was, what I, which was really what I brought to the table mm. um, in that job. Um, as long as it was a, I was able to do that, it was fine. But then we got to have so many cases that I just I really couldn't be that actively involved in each case anymore. There were just too many cases. I just had to hire outside counsel and turn them over. And at that point, um, that went on for a while. I, I persuaded the powers that be to let me hire another litigation manager. Mm -hmm. So she came on board. And we split the cases, um, and then they downsized in 2001. Um, after I'd been there for 16 or so years, and I got downsized out. Mm. They sold a lot of those companies. And, That's right. Yeah, they sold a lot of them and, and went back to a more manageable size. But by that time, that was fine with me. By that time, it was um, it was all new management, and it was not. And as I say, the job had really even with somebody taking half the cases, I mean, another litigation manager taking half the cases, I still wasn't able to have the kind of hands-on involvement in each case that I enjoyed. So, right. Uh, so then I, so that was that was the end of my day job. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's um. Well, that segues very beautifully into my next question: was was you know how have your interests and activities developed outside of work? Outside of work, well, I, I didn't stop working. I remained. Oh. I I stayed on. I did work for thermo a number of thermoelectron companies. Ma still managed. There was a number of these companies for whom I'd been managing the litigation, so they didn't have in-house litigation management. Oh. So I kept doing that, and uh, I and I kept up a private practice doing that kind of thing for a number of years after I left. Thermoelectron. That okay. was all through from 2001 to 2010 or so. Um, and I also became an arbitrator during that period. I had wanted to do that for a while, but I didn't have, I, hadn't, I just didn't have the time. So I'll confess, I, I don't yeah. really know what an arbitrator is. Well, it's a hired judge. Oh. Um, for a private, it's a private judge. I mean, you, it's a, um, yeah, it's I. I was an arbitrator for commercial disputes, which is mainly contract disputes among companies, um, as compared to say employ, employment disputes or right. other kinds of disputes. And I did commercial, uh, lit, commercial litigation, commercial disputes, and I was an arbitrator for the American Arbitration Association, and so you are matched with cases. People file application. People file an application to arbitrate. Sometimes it's required by contra their contract. Right. If they submit matters to arbitration instead of going to court. Okay. Because it's cheaper, and it's supposed to be faster. Usually was in the cases I had, um, a lot faster. And so I did that. You don't do a lot of cases per year. Uh, but I did mostly high-tech cases of various sorts because of my background. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that, you can do two or three cases a year, so it left you a lot of time to do other things. And I did that right up until five years ago, something like okay. that, six years ago. Time yeah. is flying seven years ago. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Discount the pandemic know. because who yeah, knows how long you, this you has lose, been. I lost two years yeah. there. You forget those two years. I can't. I cannot I do that arithmetic. I know. I know. Um, but to go back to the that work that you were doing, so you stayed um, providing uh, 
legal doing legal work for some of the companies that had been part of Thermo. Yeah. And then were spun back out. That's right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So again, yeah. high tech sort of stuff. Um. Some of it, not yeah. all, not all of it. No, they would. I would, when I was doing litigation management for Thermo, it would be all kinds of things. It wasn't just high tech stuff. It would be employment disputes. It would be. Um, they were mostly contract disputes. Okay. But uh, not necessarily involving technology. Some of it did. I meant the firms were still high technology. Yes, the firms, firms. were still. Yeah. yeah right. Very much so. Right. Yeah. Okay. Neat. Um, well. Did you, I guess, e even, um, well, I guess the question still kind of stands for the time that you, you know, did have time to do anything outside of work, you know, how were your, what were ex your extracurricular interests like? Well, I continued to travel a lot um, over the years. I had, um, in approximately... I became a judge for the an international arbitration competition oh. that took place in Vienna every year. I'm going to give you the dates. <laughs> I think I'm going to give you the dates if I manage to put it on this list. Oh, I didn't put it on the list. Um, I did it for eight years, and I think I did it up to 2006. Yeah. Something like that. And um, that, so that took me to Vienna every year, my, you know, one of my favorite cities. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so I did, that was, that was a wonderful experience. These were student, law student competitions of students from law schools all over the world. Mm. And I could go on about that for quite a while. But in any event, I did that um, while I was doing these, uh, this, while, I, while I had my private practice as litigation manager. And I also, uh, what did I do other than law? I was on the, I was on the board of a, a, a non-profit organization here in Cambridge for a number of years called the Cambridge Camping Association which provides after school and summer programs for mostly inner city kids. And they do a great job. And I was kind of their lawyer for, mm -hmm. on the board for, um, for many years. I was, um, I was a, well, this is law related. I was, I taught in the trial advocacy program at Harvard for 18 years, that's a, that's one of these intensive, they cram it all into three weeks, like in between semesters, to, uh, teaching kids how to try cases. Oh. And uh, so it's all, that's all vo also volunteer work. All the stuff I did was volunteer work. And so I did that for 18 years. That was fun. I also was a judge of the, hey, the Harvard, um, moot court competition, off and on for several years. And what else did I do outside of law school? Oh, I'm an avid music lover. I, I love opera, and I had become uh, quite enamored of German art songs, Lieder, when mm. I first lived in Vienna in, in 1960, 60, 61. And I still am to this day, so uh, I haven't been to any concerts since the pandemic, but I'll get back to them. <laughs> so, yeah, love that. Um, so, But every year when I went to Vienna to do the arbitration competition for those eight years, I would take another four weeks and travel around parts of Europe, mostly former Eastern Bloc countries mm. that were now available, to, you know, open to travel right. that I hadn't been able to to see when I was traveling around the world. So that was that was always fun. And family things. And my the, now my life's work is, has been for many years working on um, I have my I have a, I had a great grandmother 
for whom I am named. Her name was Mary Emma Hill, and she married my great-grandfather, William Allen. That's where my Mary Allen comes from. And her nickname was Molly. So I have this project called the Molly Project. She left us over 100 letters and six diaries and a two-volume memoir, two or three editions of it, mm. um, a bound notebook of essays and poetry and stuff like that that she wrote. And I think that's the main items. Any of that, this archive, which I've been working on now, off and on, mostly off until the pandemic. <laughs> and the, it's been a great pandemic project because I've been scanning all that. I've scanned everything into the computer. And I just finished, two days ago, I just finished transcribing it all. Oh my God. So, and I've, and I've, meanwhile, as I've gone along, I've been writing sections about her life. And so now my, now I have the fun part of, I'm not sure how, it, what direction it's going to go, but mm. something about her life. Mm. Uh, she herself was a wonderful writer, so I'm, I'm, I don't want to step on her toes, but I want to yeah. make it inviting. Whatever I write, I want to be inviting for people to go read what she wrote. Right. Oh, what a, what, yeah. Wow, what a wonderful collection. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, it's a fabulous, it's a treasure. It's really a treasure, and it's so much fun to work on. It's, I could go on and on about my great-grandmother, <laughs> but I'm sorry she's not here to be interviewed yes. because you would really get a kick out of her. <laughs> Sounds fascinating. Um, well, I wanted to ask you about your your ongoing um, connection to the other member, the other key members of the Link effort over the years. Um, after you, you know, came back to Cambridge, right. Um, right. you know, has that? Well, could you just describe, um, you know, sure. how that those yeah. connections have. Have progressed. Yeah. Well, it, we were all very collegial in the Link group. Um, I mean, we got to be very, very good friends, and we stayed in touch. We have stayed in touch over the years. There are unfortunately only a few of us left, uh, but we are in regular communication. I'm in communication with both Severo and Jerry Cox on a regular basis. Um, and uh, I, and let me see. We have had two. We've had three or four more, f more f scheduled, if you will, occasions when we've gotten together. And the first of those, after the link evaluation program, there was a there was a final link evaluation conference in 1965. At which all these researchers who'd been who'd had the machines for two years came back together and you know and reported on on their how how it had all gone and the and the results were remarkable. I mean, it was fabulous. What you know, the program generally was an overwhelming success. Mm. But from from the time I entered law school, I really didn't have any in seventy two. I really didn't have any other contact. With with any of those people, or with the computer field particularly, except through Wesley, um, until 2007, when the Vintage Computer Festival, which took place that year in Mountain View, I think it was at the Computer History Museum. I think yes, it was. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. and. Somebody got the idea. Oh, Severo had met Bruce Damer, yep. who was running the Digibarn Museum. And Bruce and Severo was living not far from Bruce up in Woodside. Severo was in Woodside, California at that time. And he met Bruce Damer, and Bruce had not heard of the link. Uh, and Severo said, Well, I can fix that. <laughs> <laughs> so he educated Bruce about the link. And uh, Bruce. Uh, was so interested, he decided to focus it at the D Vintage Computer Festival in 2007, which was the 45th anniversary of the first introduction of the link in 1962. So 
um, Jerry got a bunch of guys uh, in St. Louis to get a link up and working, actually working in 2007, yeah. and sent it to Saint, sent it to the Computer History Museum for this Vintage Computer Festival. And then they decided we would have a panel discussion about all, the, there were about eight of us on the panel the next, the, I think it was a second day of the festival. So we all trooped out there. And that was my first, I got, you know, reintroduced to the whole field. Mm. And, of, and I had to go back, of course, and start, <laughs> I better review Sorry, a few yeah. things yeah. if I'm going to speak, <laughs> say anything on this panel. And so we went out there, and in, the, in my review, I had, I had kept my, I have a couple of boxes of link stuff. So there they are. And they, they, they since, and I, I have to say since 2007, I've really never quite been able to put them away. Mm. Since that Vintage Computer Festival panel in 2007, somebody has wanted something that I have in, my, <laughs> right. in one of my boxes. Yeah. <laughs> and that, because one of the things I did I, when I was going through those boxes and I don't know reviewing whatever I was reviewing, um, I, I, have, I, I keep having asides in my mind. I'm going to do an aside here. Please. Um, I real I I started. I I, I read up on. I realized when I was doing that review that there now were books that had been written on the history of the personal computer, mm. which, of course, <laughs> we didn't have those in 1962 or 1967. But I said, oh, history of the personal computer. And I, I started reading some of that stuff to see what had happened to the personal computer, and, and only to learn that there were a number of people who thought the link had something to do with that, you know, and that the link was maybe could be called the first personal computer. We never made such a claim, and I'm not going to make it now. There are too many, many threads that go into any technological development. Um, but people were beginning to point to it as the first personal computer. I thought, well, that's very interesting, you know, 45 years later. The other thing I came across in my boxes, I came across the Polaroids of pictures that my family had taken of the link when it was in my living room in Baltimore. Mm. And there were there are two of that I took of my parents at the link and there are there's one of me at the link that my father took which is very blurry but there it is there I am at the link. I thought well these would be fun. I have this very dry 5 minutes of remarks or whatever my allotted time was. To make this would live this would you know people would get a kick out of seeing these pictures so I took the pictures along and I showed the pictures in the course of my few minutes remarks and people they were there was an impressive group of people who were at that panel uh, discussion I mean who were who were in the audience Gordon Bell was there yep. Ivan was there Bob Taylor was there. I'm not sure who else, but those three are pretty key. And one of them said to one of the other ones, and I don't remember now which direction this went. Uh, well, and Bruce had said, Bruce had interviewed me, Bruce Damer had interviewed me the day before the panel, and he had said to me, do you think that was the first use of a computer in the home? I said, I don't know, maybe, could be. I don't know of another, but that, you know, I don't know. Anyway, so that has, was already going around, the idea that that might have been the first use of a computer in the home. And sure enough, after the panel, Bob said to Ivan, or Ivan said to Gordon Bell, or one of them said to the other, do you think, one of them said to Bob Taylor, that was I, what I was told, do you think that was the first use of a computer in the home? And Bob, Taylor, and Bob reportedly said, yeah, I think it must have been. And I remember one of them, somebody came up to the table and said, you know, that's the first you computer in the home. And somebody else in the audience, not one of those three, but somebody else, you know, some bystander said, you could send, you could send it into Ripley's Believe It or Not. <laughs> I said, I don't think so. Anyway, that was the end of that. But 
that you know, it's amazing what catches the public's imagination, mm. and that caught the public's imagination. That and the fact that um, the media was beginning to notice that there had been women in the computer field way back when. Right. That happened in uh, around the same time. I mean, 2000, 2010, mm -hmm. right around in there. And there began to be museum exhibitions on women in computing. Right. There was a huge one at Potterborn, Germany, um, a few years later that I was involved in. And so it was, it was all this confluence of, oh, women in computing. You know, now, by this time, people are saying, why are girls not going into... Yeah. Computing, and right. it's become a whole thing. Right, uh, right. So, any of them. So, I began, after that, I began giving speeches, and I've given a speech about my experience in the computer field to a couple of ACM conferences and some universities, or women's co mostly women's colleges, I think, in Swarthmore, um, about my experience in the computer field, and... and the early history of women in computing, which I enjoyed learning about. So yeah. I've, I've kind of made that sort of a, a byline, I mean, a, a by, whatever, a byproduct of something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, that is so interesting because I was just, I mean, I had a question here about, like, um, about this appreciate, the changing historical appreciation of the link, you know, and it just seems yeah. like it's, you know, I, from my just from my point of view, it seems like steadily and steadily yeah. increasing. Yeah. Joe November's book, really, you know, um, about biomedical computing, right. also really yes. yeah. helps to put a lot of this on, you know, a, a kind of a solid footing for certain audiences. You know, it's yeah. it's really interesting to yeah. see how it's just yeah. progressively becoming great. Yes. The appreciation just increases and yes. increases. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. It has that has to me too. And um I have tried to use my I mean, if I'm being asked to give a speech because I'm a woman, so be it. I'm gonna go talk about the link, <laughs> you know, and tell you why it was important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just did a, a Zoom interview for my high school, friend school in Baltimore. It was only, you know, 20 minutes because we had to fit it all into one class period right. and it was only 40 minutes and they yeah. wanted, they needed time for a and a Right. But I, I said, the first question you should ask me is why is the link important? And my answer to that is because it revolutionized biomedical research and because it was a precursor to the first personal computer. Um, and, you know, how, you know, and then you can fill in the gaps with why each of those things came about. Right. Uh, but those are the two main, those are the two salient features of the link. Uh, and so it was, it was a remarkable thing to have been a part of. Mm. Yeah. I'm so um, just lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've had, a, I've been lucky in a lot of ways in my life, but that one was, that one was special. Mm. That one was special. Well, yeah. I, I did have a, a question for you about, um, I mean, maybe you just answered it, um, which was, you know, reflecting back, what do you see as the most important thing or things for people to understand about the link effort and its influence? And I think... I just answered that. You just answered that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think there's any big misunderstanding? Kind of the converse of that, something that you see people maybe saying about the link that you don't, you know, you don't think that's a great interpretation of what happened, or I don't think there's any great misunderstanding about it once you put it in context. I mean, you know, there was one, there was one article I came across on the internet about women computing. Women, women, computer pioneers, or something, mm -hmm. and um, and one of the things they talked about was the link and me, and they 
And one of the commentators said, well, you can't call that a personal computer. It's way too big. Well, of course. This is 19. <laughs> this is 2022. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's that kind of thing, but I don't, I don't really count that as no. being major detractors. One of my favorite detractor stories is from 1962, because everybody's mindset was so imbued with the idea that you had to have punch cards in order to communicate with a computer, that at, at the NIH demonstration in, 19, in April of 1962, one of the people who was there... Um, fortunately, I think maybe he was the only one, came, you know, was watching this and watching demonstration and said, said, that'll never work. And Wesley said to him, why not? He said, because there's no way to get the data in. Hmm. He, didn't, he didn't think the keyboard was important. He didn't think the switches were important. He didn't think the cables from in, to the analog to digital conversion circuits were a way to get the data in, and his mind was so set on the on, in a punched card mm. environment that if you didn't have punched cards or at least a punched paper tape, how are you going to get the data in? <laughs> so yes, there were there were a few people like that, but I'm afraid their their frame of reference is too narrow to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> um. And to get just two kind of closing general questions, um, you know, what has what what do you feel is most important to you about um, your involvement with computing? What do you think is hmm. the major thing you've taken away from it? I think. Aside from the wonderful friendships and the strong bonds that we all had, which have really been of lifelong importance to all of us, um, but as far as the technology is concerned, what I got out of it as a still a fairly young, impressionable mind <laughs> uh, was the discipline of thought, the rigor of thought, the ability to recognize when my thinking was making sense and when it wasn't, <laughs> and to just... Um, Carry that's something you carry with you your whole life. Now I started with that. I mean, I think it does. You you have to have a certain aptitude for the kind of mental activity that's required in doing stuff with computers or math or engineering or you know mm -hmm. most any of the sciences. Uh, but you have to you do have to learn that somewhere, and you have to learn your own limitations in that regard, which is, I think, was working on, you know, taking, tackling some really tough problems. I, and, and the same thing happened in law. I mean, you, you, can, you can come up, you can hit a wall there too, you know. <laughs> okay, let's try another direction here. But you have to be able to, A, pursue it, and then know when to change directions, when to back off when to recognize that you need to formulate things a different way or just do something different. Mm. Um, I think, I guess just the short answer is intellectual development. How's that? For <laughs> perfect answer. <laughs> um, well, this is, a, and our, my final question is one that we ask um, everybody we do an interview with. And... Um, it's very interesting, the, the responses to it. We ask uh, people that if they could give one word of advice to someone just starting out in their career, uh, what would that one word be, one word of advice, and, and why? Any career or a career in the computer field? <clears throat> Any career, or, or 
you know, or computing, you know, whichever, but, you know, maybe in general. One word. One word. Um, Enjoy. Mm. And the reason? The reason. I I think it's important to find something you enjoy doing. People talk about, I, I think sometimes young people are being told you have to find your passion. I think that's intimidating. Um, I don't think you have to find your passion. I think what you, the best thing you can do for yourself is to find something that you enjoy doing that you're pretty relatively good at or could become good at, and then go for it. The passion will find you if it's something you like doing, which includes the environment in which you will be working. Um, because if you don't enjoy it, if it's not fun, if there's not some pleasure in it, you're going to be miserable. Even if you're talented at it, even if it's something that everybody else thinks you ought to be doing, uh, don't, don't go there. Don't, you have a long life. You, you need to enjoy. That's great. Thank <laughs> you. Well, that's, those are all the questions oh, I all right. had. Well, if it's we, been a pleasure. Oh, my gosh. The pleasure has been all mine.